Hello there. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, my name is Kevin May. I'm the editor and co-founder of uh, T News. Um, we are here for uh, another great webinar. We hope so. Um, this is the latest in a series of webinars. We've had so many of these uh, uh, this year. We've, we're very excited. Once again, we are put this, uh, we're putting this one on uh, with uh, Travelport, and we are tackling a brand new subject for any of our webinars. So we, you know, we're very uh, grateful that they've decided to collaborate with us on this one. So, um, very brief introduction. So, you know, we, we've, we've been looking at this for quite a while. I mean, today's travel industry is pretty much kind of characterized by um, an interconnected network of technologies. Now, some of them are interconnected in better ways and less uh, less better ways than others. So, But really, every corner of the industry is now impacted by technology and how they interact with each other. Now, these are, uh, I suppose, open ecosystems, and they do enable kind of collaboration a lot more nowadays than they did before. Uh, allows creativity of speed and innovation, some argue. And, and But what it really does do is kind of start spearheading this kind of drive towards more product services and tools. But what does this actually mean for every sector or every corner of the industry? Um, and how do you, the listeners today and, and, and your colleagues and those who will be listening later on, how do you kind of keep up with this pace of change? So what we've got for you uh, today is a 60-minute webinar, slightly less than that because we did start a few minutes late. Sorry about that. And um, we've got a, a great panel. I'm also joined, as always, by uh, Gene Quinn, who's my uh, co-founder and the CEO of uh, TNews. And also our panelists are... Uh, uh, Valen Perini, uh, she's the CEO of the Open Travel Alliance. Uh, she is uh, with me, in fact, well, not right with me, but she's in the same city as me in Singapore, and so is Jean Quinn. We're here for the Web in Travel Conference this week. Uh, we're also joined by uh, Jason Nash, who's the Vice President of Product Innovation for Travelport. He is at uh, Travelport's UK headquarters uh, uh, just west of London. Uh, we're also joined by Armin Kroll, who's the CEO of uh, Car Pilots. He's in Sydney, Australia. Uh, and we're also joined by uh, Rui Fegarido, who is the partner head of product development at Travel Technology and Solutions. He's in Lisbon, the capital of Portugal. So we really are uh, everywhere today, a very a global webinar. So uh, we're very glad that you can all join us. So a few bits of housekeeping. First of all, most importantly, we are recording the entire event. So if you have to dip out or if you want to pass on to your colleagues later on, as I said earlier, you can do so. We put the video up, we hope, around uh, 24, within 24 hours of, of this uh, live webinar now. Um, we'll also be all the slides uh, that you'll be seeing over the course of the, uh, uh, the next hour, we post them also within the same article, so don't worry about too much about missing any of that detail. Um, there will be a chance for you to ask questions. You can do that very simply by pressing the question button uh, on the right-hand side of your dashboard there, and you could just send a question through to us. We will have an opportunity for a Q&A right at the end of the webinar, usually about 10, 15 minutes once we've got through uh, the presentation. So uh, you can send your questions throughout um, the next, um, uh, over the next 50 minutes, 45, 50 minutes, or at the end. So we'll try and get through to as many of those questions as we can. And we'll also be interspersing the webinar with various polls. Um, those of you that have listened into one of our webinars before you know that we like to do this. It kind of gives us a chance to gauge what the audience is uh, thinking, where it is uh, at the start of the webinar, and how possibly it might think of change its opinion as we go through. But to give you a little bit of chance uh, to test the system, we've got a little. Uh, uh, our first poll here is a little experiment. It's very simple. So, uh, Gene, if you can throw up the uh, the first poll, very simple. Where are you located? And uh, we'll start to have a look at those answers come in, and then we'll just make sure that everyone can see the results. So North America, EMEA, Asia Pacific, Latin America. And let's let's have those results up there, shall we, Gene? OK, so exactly, well, almost exactly two thirds of you are in North America, uh, slightly later in the day uh, in EMEA, but one in uh, three out of 10, 29%. Uh, Asia Pacific, zero uh, percent. That's apart from me, Gene, and Valen. But we can't vote. That's why it says zero percent and four percent Latin America. So thank you very much. That's the first poll. And um, that's, as you said, just to get you familiar with the system. So our second poll, I believe, is coming up now. So this is slightly more relevant to about for about what you to listen to. So. I'll read the question and then you can read the answers yourselves. Which of these factors will have the greatest impact on development of products and services in the travel industry? P please click one of those three.
Okay, starting to vote. Maybe some of you have not even, even considered this question before. Ah, right, a lot more votes coming in. And this, our partner will be in Travelport, very pleased with the result of this one, hopefully. So let's let's throw those results up there, Jean, please. Okay, so uh, nearly 60% say the creation of an open ecosystem of tools and APIs for developers. So well done, Travelport. I guess some of your message is getting through, or the wider message that has been debated in the industry. And as you can see, those are the other uh, two results there. 11% uh, just for uh, R&D. So let's let's crack on. I think um, our first uh, speaker or our first panelist uh, today is uh, Jason Nash. As I said, he's the VP for Product Innovation at Travelport, and he is talking to us today from uh, Langley, just west of London. So, uh, Jason, good evening from me. Good afternoon to you. Hello. Thanks. Hello there, and um, <laughs> thank you very much. And I'm now going to hand over to you. Great to start off with. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, so I'm going to hand over to you. Um, the floor is yours, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what you've got to say, Jason. Thanks very much. So maybe if we could move to our first slide, that would be great. Um, I guess what we really want to talk about today is, is our open platform. And it's one of the, the strategic pillars that uh, we are investing in at Travelport at the current time. Uh, I think that you know, many of our customers today, uh, not only our traditional uh, suppliers and subscribers, but also those travel independent software vendors that build solutions on top of Travel Ports technology uh, have a pretty costly and complex environment that they have to work with and support. Um, not only are there multiple APIs and content sources that they tend to work with and pull together and aggregate, but many of these API sources are costly to maintain, they're constantly changing, many of the, the interfaces and, and the way of being able to connect to them are different. And if you're looking to be able to support uh, different uh, environments like mobile and, and uh, you know, the ongoing technology change that's driven through Moore's law and the like, uh, it's a very uh, time-consuming um, set, of, set of criteria that you have to manage and work with. And what we are increasingly trying to do is enable a platform that uh, allows our customers to be able to connect to our content and provide it out not only through our traditional uh, channels but also through more of these new channels. Uh, next slide. So I think you know I think people understand increasingly what uh, an uh, open platform is, uh, and you know there are many many examples of successful companies that have built open platforms. You know we could take Apple as one great example of that where, you know, yes, they make great hardware, um, but actually it's the apps that not only Apple make, but that their partner ecosystem make and invest in that actually makes it such a compelling platform uh, and such a great solution. And I think that increasingly um, we recognize that the GDSs themselves are open platforms. They're probably, you could argue, some of the earliest open platforms that were out there. But traditionally, we were seen more as kind of walled gardens than actually open platforms. Um, however, uh, if you look at the uh, organization, the ecosystem that's grown up around us over the years, there are a number of partners that uh, exist today uh, that have grown up uh, around the, the, uh, the GDSs. But I think one of the things that we've really recognized in the last couple of years at Travelport is that if we can uh, tap into this ecosystem and work with them more closely and actually give them great tools and great facilities to be able to uh, not only build their own solutions and extend those solutions out to their own customers, but we can also, if you like, deliver the next generation of, of travel experience and, and really help to facilitate uh, the transactions that flow through the travel supply chain. And, and in particular here, you know, this is about uh, not only worrying about the B2B connectivity, but also the B2B to C connectivity as well. How do we actually make sure that the end traveler experience right through the travel supply chain 
is uh, being optimized and that the customer experience is one that everybody that's involved in the uh, platform can leverage and uh, take value from. And I think that's an important factor that many of these open platforms need to be able to deliver. It's value to all of the ecosystem that operates within it. So in our case, that's our travel suppliers, it's our additional subscribers, it's those independent uh, travel software providers, etc., that are part of our ecosystem. Next slide, please. So what is our open platform? Well, in reality, the open platform at Travelport is something we call Travelport Universal API. And it's the first global GDS API to really aggregate traditional GDS uh, air, car, and hotel content, but with uh, new content types as well. Uh, Low-cost carrier content, uh, rail, and of course, the new merchandising uh, content that's increasingly important as traditional uh, airline providers bundle and unbundle their offerings, the bags and seats and, and the rest of uh, the, the options that the airlines are increasingly offering as they become more like retailers. What it really is in simple terms, and it's spelled out there in the slide very simply, but it's a single API that uh, developers and third parties can work with. And uh, it's really uh, the same API that our developers that build our solutions uh, are using as well. So our universal desktop that many of you will have heard of in the past and, and that we're uh, uh, launching right now in actual fact, as we take it out of the, the beta uh, program that it's been involved in, uh, is built on top of this same uh, code base. So not only is it a, a rich set of content and a normalized content as well, but it's also a set of services. And the two services that we make uh, available today are the universal profile, which is a rich travel profile, which stores uh, a lot more than just the, the customer's base details. Uh, it actually stores uh, uh, preferences. It allows uh, the traveler to uh, make sure that their loyalty numbers and the like constantly make it into the booking. And profile data, customer data, will be super important in the future as we continue to bundle and unbundle the offerings. We won't even be able to provide um, you know, relevant search results if we're not able to understand what loyalty card levels that customers have and how those uh, are then represented in terms of the free bag or seat that may be available or not. So it's increasingly in the future going to be about relevance, not how many shopping results the GDSs provide, but actually the right shopping results that the uh, customer at the end of the phone that the uh, travel management company is working with is interested in buying. And again, predictive analytics and these kind of things, big data types of technology will be super important in this environment. And again, powering that on top of an open platform makes a lot more sense than powering it on top of the traditional travel records, the PNR, the traditional uh, profiles, which really were very much uh, less structured and uh, much uh, less powerful in terms of their uh, ability to be able to give us uh, rich data sources, sources to query and to uh, expose, not only through our own products, but those through our partner ecosystem. Next slide, please. So um, a rather uh, large and somewhat complex slide. I guess what we're really trying to talk about here is how uh, the existing content sources that we provide today in Travelport, so not only our uh, three GDS cores that we pr uh, provide today, Worldspan, Apollo, and uh, Galileo, but also the new content sources that we've uh, plugged in, not only the rail, air content, and merchandising hub, but things like our Rooms and More content source, which is the uh, very rich hotel database that we've provided with over 380,000 hotel properties in, where we've aggregated uh, some of the aggregators together to be able to provide a very comprehensive set of data. You might want to just switch forward in the slide as it builds here. Um, this content uh, is really uh, available and powered um, through uh, as we can see here at the bottom, uh, 
through uh, a series of hubs, which allow us to seamlessly integrate this content together. And the key thing here is that we are taking a lot of different content from a lot of different places, and if you let the slide build again, uh, we're effectively normalizing it. We're taking away those individual elements that are uh, different uh, and actually putting a level of normalization in there so that people that want to capture this content and use it, whether that's pricing information, shopping results, um, you know, metadata, et cetera, are able to be able to compare a lot of different data sources and bring them together. So for example, uh, you know, how, how this is exposed in our points of sale, like Universal Desktop, some of the others mentioned there, is through an aggregated shop. So the ability to be able to see uh, low-cost carriers with traditional GTS carriers in a single uh, window to get that better uh, shopping experience. And that same normalization and aggregation can be consumed by anybody that's using the open platform. So not only our own points of sale, but also, uh, as it says there, you know, uh, other um, providers that want to be able to consume and use that content in a normalized and uh, uh, simplified way. Next slide, please. So really, you know, if I just talk very quickly to this, the, the universal uh, API is that middle layer that's connecting those pieces together, which is a series of content and services as we provide them. So our research um, really is, is very sort of um, reinforcing of what we've found here. And I guess, you know, as we've done a, a quite a bit of research over the last two years, as we decided to become a much more open um, uh, GDS and where we're increasingly now making it super easy for people to work with us and sign up. So, you know, today if uh, a third party wants to work with us and get access to UAPI, that can be done simply through filling in a form online and being provisioned in a sandbox environment where they can start to get access to the documentation and the API calls immediately. There's no salesperson to speak to. We've deliberately made it easy because that's the way that third parties want to work, especially in the travel independent software vendor space. And in terms of some of the metrics, you know, we, we've currently uh, um, we've got had feedback from over 170 agents across uh, EMEA, uh, and you know, the, the feedback that we've got is that a lot of the spend that these companies are working on is uh, around maintaining and keeping these connections in place today. And so, you know, over 50%, as it says there, of our customers are maintaining six or more API connections. 30% of them are more than 10 connections. And the cost that they are spending on maintaining all these connections and managing this themselves is a very significant uh, proportion of their overall IT investment. So, you know, not only have we looked to do this to drive the ecosystem, but we've looked to do this to actually reduce the cost uh, and increase the value that we provide uh, as a GDS through being this open platform that allows people to get this aggregated content in a single uh, one-stop shop. Next slide, please. So in effect, you know, what we are uh, part of the way through on our journey is uh, we're uh, looking to create a travel platform. Uh, and we've made a number of uh, uh, successes in this space over the last couple of years. As we said, the Universal API has been out in market for over two years now, uh, and it allows uh, third parties to connect and, and get content from the sources we mentioned, and we're constantly enriching and adding to that, and as I said, the rooms and more content uh, is being fed in right now. It's in uh, an alpha release and will be available in the beginning of uh, next year. We've uh, made an investment in a uh, uh, developer uh, network, as we call it. So we have a very uh, comprehensive uh, website where developers can get hold of documentation, sample code, where they can collaborate and share ideas with other developers. And uh, we're extending that in the new year with actually an innovation lab where people will actually be able to go and see some of the ideas and concepts that we're working on, on t internally and then see how we can work uh, in that broader ecosystem to maybe bring some of those ideas to market 
more quickly or more effectively than we would do if we were to do something like this on our own. Uh, then we've clearly got the Universal Desktop SDK, and we're going to see uh, through one of the other panelists a little later how some of these things are starting to come to life in the Universal Desktop right now. Uh, the Universal Desktop, as I said, we're in the process of launching that product now, although it's been in the hands of, of some of our customers like Flight Center for quite some time. We're actually now starting the, the global rollout of the product. And then really our, our ultimate aim with some of this uh, and we have a little bit further to go on this particular um, objective, is to deliver uh, a form of travel uh, marketplace where uh, third parties that are part of our ecosystem are able to not only um, uh, talk about their products and, and market them, which we already have available today uh, in the uh, developer network, but also to be able to really make that a very seamless experience and make that very easy for uh, what, what I would describe as you know the long tail of content that exists in the market today, making that really easy for people to get hold of and share. Next slide, please. Thanks. So the developer network that we have in place today really consists of three key pieces. Um, there are square tools available. Uh, and that this is really you know, access to the software developer kit for Universal Desktop, but also access to the Universal API um, so, uh, uh, code to be able to uh, connect to that and get access to our content, and the services that we're plug plugging into that. And today, as I said, the two primary services are the Universal Record and the Universal Profile. But in the future, we'll be adding new services into there that we'll be able to share with the ecosystem. And that'll be things like uh, policy engines. That'll be things like trip approval that can be centralized but then shared across apps. And we think we've got some really uh, interesting ideas in this space that are uh, a little bit outside the box thinking in terms of the way we are looking to position this. Uh, in terms of this open platform than maybe you would think from a traditional GDS. In addition to that, we've got the technical support and community areas, uh, which, as I said, allow a lot of self-service support, but also access to some of our own uh, technology partner uh, support people who are able to support third parties. And then finally, marketing and commercial support, which is this whole idea of being able to certify the app get the apps uh, promoted and marketed uh, working in conjunction with us. So really, you know, trying to get uh, and work as an ecosystem collectively to enhance and drive value for all parties. Next slide, please. So I've talked uh, about, um, and if you probably want to just let this slide build, there are three clicks, I believe. So I've talked about the fact that the open platform is an extremely important part of our strategy at Travelport. It's only one part of that strategy, though, and there are three other pieces that I thought I'd just bring you up to speed on. The other one is empowered selling experience, and this is really about delivering great selling experiences, a great shop window for people to get hold of our content. And this really is the, the universal desktop that we've talked about for a long time and are very close to uh, pushing out uh, in certain markets as we go into next year. Uh, we've been in a, a very extensive beta program over the last 12 months with that product it, with uh, over 30 customers involved in seven markets. Uh, the other key pieces, of course, are intelligent search, making sure we're able to deliver the right results in the right places. Uh, and making those uh, results increasingly relevant, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of great uh, travel uh, profile and uh, content and relevance. And then finally, you know, and probably the most important part is this unrivaled travel content. Being able to bring all this content together through a single API that enables people to deliver rich and powerful travel applications. So thanks very much for your time. I'll hand back to Kevin. Um, and uh, I'll take any questions later. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Jason. Uh, really interesting stuff there. So um, before we go over to uh, Valen's uh, presentation, just a, a point of order to a certain extent is that um, 
we've been running here in uh, Singapore, which is why the T-News team is here, uh, one of our T-Hacks, which is a, a developer-led uh, hackathon. And um, those of you that haven't seen the story on T-News in the last 24 hours uh, will be pleased to learn that one of, the, uh, one of the winners, we had two winners, but one of the winners used the Travelport uh, API as part of its winning hack. This was a team from Skyscanner, which is the, uh, uh, the meta search engine, but you can read all about that on, uh, uh, on, on T-News.com. So anyway, uh, moving swiftly on, uh, Valen Perini, the CEO of Open Travel Alliance. Um, good evening to you. You're in here in Singapore with me. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Okay, I'm going to hand over to you straight away. Thanks, Valen. All right. All right. Well, thank you all. Thank you all for attending, and um, and I'm I'm pleased that I'm still awake at 11:28 in the evening here in Singapore. So, without further ado, Jean, if you would move forward, and I'm going to talk briefly about why, um, as op the Open Travel Alliance, and um, why we believe standards and open standards, open development in the travel industry is important. Briefly, um, who we are? We are a not-for-profit trade association that was uh, created about 10 or 10 or 12 years ago. And what we do is, as a trade association, we work with our member companies to create um, standard schema structures using XML and now XML um, object-based schemas to create sort of communication protocols uh, that trading partners in the travel industry use to exchange information. So just to be clear, we are not an aggregator. Uh, we are not any kind of flow through for inventory or information. We create XML schemas using the expertise provided by companies in the travel industry, and then we provide those schemas back into the industry. Um, so, Jean, if you would move on to the next slide, and I'll give a little background about who we are. I consider Open Travel to be one of the pioneers in open source or open architecture in the travel industry. We were created in 1999, back when um, online distribution of travel information and, and inventory was still pretty much the Wild West. Um, and we were created by a group of suppliers, hotel companies, airlines, car rental companies, um, a GDS, uh, some uh, technology providers in the travel industry, specifically to ensure that information um, was exchanged between travel trading partners in a, sort of a, uh, in a manageable, reasonable format. And they decided at, in 1999 that they would be the ones to do that, that they would lead the way. And so, we started the organization in 99 with about 50 companies. Um, and since then, we have sort of tripled in size. We have about 150 companies who um, work with us on a daily basis to create these structures. Um, we started, as I mentioned, originally generally with the legacy, um, legacy travel segments. And when I say legacy, I mean um, uh, established travel segments, so airline, car rental companies, and hotel companies. Um, and we've been working since then to create these standards. We found recently that, um, that we are appealing to, just like everyone else, and as um, Jason mentioned in his, in his presentation, we are very interested in the long tail segment and in startup companies because, um, frankly, some of the, the, the legacy providers in air and car and um, hotel companies, uh, while they haven't solved all of their distribution problems, they uh, have uh, years of knowledge now in how to address this challenge. We, we find ourselves more and more these days providing education and schema solutions to long tail and startups, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later on. Jean, if you can move on to my next slide. So we have been, as I mentioned, we've been in business since 1999. We started in, we actually started publishing schema in 2001. Um, hundreds, even though we have 150 member companies um, within Open Travel, we give away our schema. So anyone can go to opentravel.org and download our schema right now if you're so inclined. Um, and, you, and implement your schema in your technical environment to use with your trading partners. Um, so, so we know that there are hundreds and hundreds of companies worldwide that have implemented our schema, um, even though uh, our membership is smaller than that, because again, we wanted to have almost no barrier to entry, almost no barrier to creating this open form of communication between um, companies in the travel industry. We also know that because of the, the breadth and depth of the implementation of our schema, that there are millions of messages exchanged between trading partners every day around the world based on our schema. And actually millions is a, is, is a really conservative number. It would be, it's very easy for me to say billions, but you know, billions on a slide just sort of looks really self-serving. So I decided to stick with millions. 
but it's, it's entirely accurate and it shows you um, how much of the communications in the industry that fly around through the ether every day are built on the standard schema structures that we built in a completely open and transparent fashion. Gene, if you would keep moving for me. So why open standards? So you know, this is, a, well, for one thing, this is a webinar about open development in the travel industry. Um, but for us, the creation of open source software, and uh, this, this would be true of any uh, initiative for open source software out there, is that it has to be the methodology for building the product, whatever that product might be, has to be transparent and it has to allow for full participation in the, industry, um, in the, in the process. So for open travel, any company in the travel industry can join. Our bylaws explicitly exclude us uh, from or prohibit us from excluding any company. That's because we want to be fully credible in the industry that, in fact, the process that we're using to develop these schemas is fully open and available to anyone. Any individual can comment. So, um, so any company can join, but we also have a method on our website to take comments on any of our schema or any of our other artifacts that we produce to support our schema, um, anyone can comment. And we actually cure every single comment that we get, and we get hundreds of them every year, um, telling us from such mundane things as there's been a misspelling in an annotation to uh, that we completely, um, we completely screwed up a, uh, a particular component structure. So we get all sorts of comments. We take every comment seriously because, again, to be considered an open and credible organization, we have to allow everyone to participate in the industry. We're neutral, so we, we do not have any type of, we're not a subsidiary of any other company. We exist solely on the dues paid by our member companies, um, and that allows us to be fully independent and fully neutral, and again, underscores our credibility in the marketplace. No one can ever um, accuse us of, uh, of serving the needs of a particular segment or a particular business model um, or a particular company, if you get all the way down to it. And we're bias free. So we do not care what the business model is of any company in the travel industry. We are not here to advocate uh, direct connects to suppliers or to advocate the validity of the business model of intermediaries. We don't care. We, the market, will make those decisions about which of those models better serves the need of end users or the trading partners involved. We build our schema in such a way that, that um, it serves the needs of any company out there. Um, and finally, we give them away because uh, the ability to actually get to the schema and utilize it and pay nothing for it, we believe truly fosters um, an open and democratic system of uh, implementing schema in the travel industry and leveling the playing field for everyone out there. Gene, if you would move forward for me. So um, um, one of the things that we talk about when, um, when, when we discuss um, open structures and open source is that um, there's the benefit for the industry, but, but reusing existing schema structures or standard schemas has benefits for the company that actually implements them. Um, and so there are, these are two of the two, these are two the top two benefits for any company, really in indus, any industry using any kind of standard. Um, and a standard, you know, a, a non-travel industry standard would be um, a light bulb, uh, for example, or the cans uh, that food comes in on the grocery store shelves. Those are all standards created by those industries to facilitate number one manufacturing costs and development costs, um, and also to help consumers. Um, understand and utilize products better. So we, as a, as a standards body serving the travel industry, we're really no different. Um, reusing existing schema um, over and over again allows a company to reduce its development costs because the company is not creating the wheel every time they go to connect to a new travel partner or every time they um, decide to put a new product into the marketplace. Um, and using a known communication structure so uh, provides credibility and stability for that company. So it's easy for a company to say, like Travelport, for example, which is a member of the Open Travel Alliance, as you know, a matter of full disclosure, utilizes our schema in some of their segments um, and allows them to be able to say to the industry at large that they do, in fact, support a standards body that, um, that utilizes an open and uh, transparent structure to build schema. One of the things that we've actually started talking about recently, we've, as I mentioned, we, we've 
we have initially served the legacy travel segments, but we're finding that more and more startups and companies in the long tail are really, uh, really utilizing our services and, and really talking to us much more than they have, have ever in the past because they see that these two benefits um, are, are valuable for them. They appeal to, they appeal to their investors, uh, they appeal, appeal to the investment community because their costs are low and there's some cr credibility involved. And of course they appeal, appeal to potential trading partners, especially as startups look to connect to these legacy travel co companies. The, travel, the legacy companies know who we are. Uh, the startup companies may not. And so we're finding that as they know more about us, they're much more eager to talk to us and embrace our products because it allows them to have easier conversations with the, the established travel companies in the industry. So for us, we're, we, we find ourselves moving sort of into this open world, um, serving a different segment than we did when we first started the organization back in 1999. It's a very exciting place for us to be. We're really pleased to be here. Jane, can you go to my next slide, please? So one of the things that we do, um, we, are initially, we are really basically a technology company. We're a very so small software development house um, because we create on a regular basis. We publish uh, schemas and, um, and we go through our own you know, sort of quality control and development milestones in-house. We also realize that as we move into the long tail and the startup community that we have to provide um, really uh, solid supporting artifacts um, to support implementation, to support the, um, the growth of knowledge of startups and long-tail companies um, and any other type of new entrant into the, into the travel industry um, with their own education. So we've started, we've started to embrace more modern technology structures for our own internal um, schema. So as I mentioned, we're embracing XML objects, using uh, UML models and type libraries to allow for much more um, easy implementation, much quicker to market for uh, new products and partners. And it's our job we see as serving the industry and embracing open source software to, to help make travel companies more responsive to the market and more responsive to the customers. That keeps us relevant to the industry, which keeps us in business, which um, is a good thing as far as I'm concerned. And um, it also uh, allows for uh, the proliferation of education, the spread of education into the long tail in the startup community so that they better, they, they have, they, they build stronger products, they feel included in the industry, they bring their innovation into the industry in, uh, in a way that if we didn't exist, we believe that it wouldn't be quite so easy for them to come into the marketplace. So that's how we view our role, um, especially in this sort of new world um, with the proliferation of startups, as Kevin mentioned. We're here in Singapore, we had a T-hack, WIT, uh, Web and Travel had its own um, startup pitch contest. There's a lot going on and we want to make sure that we provide a service to those startup companies in the long tail, just like we've always done to the legacy companies. Jane, if you wouldn't mind moving on. So as an example of technical leadership, this is just a view of something that we create, one of our new artifacts. We create an XML cookbook. Um, a cookbook is a term that technologists use and it is basically a, a document, an artifact that explains every, every way um, every component of a, of a given artifact and how to implement that artifact, whatever it might be, a schema, a type library, a building a model to, um, to illustrate that, that, uh, that schema. We provide a lot, more, a lot more artifacts than we have in the past because, again, we believe that that, that helps the industry uh, embrace us and it also brings new players and innovation into the company. You can see over on the left, those are a list of tools that we provide to implementers. Um, so again, we want to make sure that there's not much of an excuse to not adopt uh, the work that we do and not embrace the open development of software in the travel industry. Jean, if you would move on. And just, I'm not going to read all of this. You can all look at it at your leisure when you download the, um, the presentation after, after, our, our, um, after this webinar is over. But I did want to just show that as part of our goal to create commercial distribution solutions for the industry, over on the left is the list of um, segments in the travel industry that we have already created solutions for. And the two um, columns on the right are the functional areas. Um, of course, not every segment uses every functional area. Some are specific to a given segment. But this gives you an idea of the breadth of the work that we've done. All of it in this open development, in this way that supports open development and full transparency in the industry. 
Uh, so Jean, that is my last slide. If you want to just move on to my sort of closing slide, it reminds me to stop talking. Um, and that's, that, that is my presentation for today. Okay, thank you very much, Valen. Um, We've got one final poll. We've, we're very conscious that we're, uh, we're, we're using up everybody's time here and we do want to finish as close to on the hour as we can. So uh, let's go to the final poll here before we go into the two case studies. Uh, sorry, the penultimate poll. Right, let's see the question then, please, Jean. So which of the following is your company's most important result that will come from open development? Number one, spurs innovation. Two, speeds up time to market for new products and partnerships. Or three, reduces development costs. If you'd like to cast your votes, please. Lots of people undecided at the moment. Ah, okay. More, more of you voting. That's great. So let's just give it another couple of seconds, Gene, and then let's throw out the results. Yeah. Okay, let's have the results, Gene. Okay, so just over half, 56% of you say it does actually speed up time to market for new products and partnerships. Um, the least one was there's the Spurs, in, uh, Spurs Innovation. So um, let's, um, let's have a quick look at the next case study. Now, these uh, two that you're going to hear are slightly shorter presentations, as uh, short presentations, definitely. So, but they're just talking about what they've been doing using the, the, uh, the, 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 the travel port system. So first of all, very delighted to introduce Armin Kroll, who's the CEO of Car Pilots. He's in Sydney, Australia. It's kind of not even morning for him really yet. So, uh, but good morning to you, Armin, and the floor is yours. Let's uh, let's hear what you've got to say. Thank you very much, Shane, and hello, everyone. Um, my name is Armin. Uh, I'm the CEO of Car Pilots. Um, so, as Jane mentioned, I'll be giving a brief review of, of uh, Car Pilots and uh, and also a quick demo of uh, the product that we've built into the Travelport Universal Desktop. Um, thank you. So CarPods is a national booking system, basically for limousine transfers, private driver services and taxi providers. Uh, at the heart of our system, uh, we've built a method to calculate the cost of um, any fare from any pickup point on a map to any drop-off point on a map. Um, all fares, including taxi fares, um, are calculated and prepaid up front. Next slide, please. Thank you. So, in our case, um, uh, the, the travel port um, open market approach has been absolutely great. Um, we've now got access to content and opportunities that, that normally would have been closed off to us. And for a startup such as ours, you know, um, who've actually previously haven't had GDS experience, we've been able to use our existing resources, uh, our existing skill sets and booking tools, and pretty much use this to simply plug into the universal desktop. And we've been able to do this fairly quickly. So the slide that we're looking at uh, at the moment, just gives a bit of an overview of our solution. Um, from, a, from the supply side, we have aggregated ground transfers, uh, ground, ground transfer providers uh, onto the platform, and the car pilot system does absolutely everything. So it, it manages the, the drivers, the dispatch uh, of, of the jobs as well, manages the travel agent workflow, and also manages the passenger experience and the notifications. From the demand side, our, our GDS strategy is absolutely crit, uh, critical. Um, we distribute via independent travel agents, uh, we integrate into online travel agents via uh, web APIs and uh, also deliver corporate staff transfer solutions. Um, a whole lot of that is, is, is something that we're rolling out to Deloitte at the moment for, for a thousand of its staff uh, around Australia. And of course, uh, finally a major strategy of ours is, is the retail side, which is via our website and our, our smartphone, our iPhone, Android uh, um, booking apps. Um, next slide, please. So let's just jump straight into the demo. Um, what we're looking at here is, is a basic travel port universal desktop screenshot um, as used by agents basically to, to organize uh, or book travel services for customers. And, and what I've highlighted um, is the agent workflow or, or sales runway. Um, Jason touched on this earlier, but from, from left to right, um, we've got what's called a profile module which captures customer details. We, we have the air module which is used for flight bookings. We have the hotel module uh, used for accommodation bookings. And then of course the, the car pilots ground transfers module. Um, now if you'll notice it, it sits quite logically within the workflow, within the, within the job workflow. Um, and finally th there's the trip review module which is, which is essentially the, the trip summary and the, the itinerary. Um, 
putting the focus back on, on the Carpolis ground transfers module, um, uh, the module itself can be used as a standalone tool for, for getting price, uh, fair prices between any two points on a map or any two addresses on a map, or uh, it can be used as part of an existing booking workflow. So uh, for today's demo, we'll, we'll assume that it's used as part of a booking workflow. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So, uh, in the demo that, that I've set up here, um, the, the following booking details have already been entered. So, we've used the profile and the air and the hotel modules. Um, so, uh, we, we have the client's name. Uh, let's assume we also have his, his home address as well, um, as well as his work address. We've booked a flight in this particular example, uh, Sydney to Melbourne, um, a return a week later. Uh, Melbourne to Sydney, and he'll be staying at, at, at a local hotel during his stay, um, stay there as well. Now, under a normal circumstance, uh, a travel agent, if, if they were asked to organise the ground transfer, um, a normal process would be to call through to multiple providers, uh, either rely on personal contacts or, 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 or a wholesale rate card, which by itself is, is extraordinarily, extraordinarily uh, limiting. Um, but, but the reality is, and, and the feedback that we've had is that, uh, frankly, it's just too hard, so that, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't really bother. Um, but um, for a universal desktop user, um, the process is, is really quite straightforward. Um, what all, the, all they do is simply uh, click on the, on the module, the Carpolis Ground Transfers module, and, uh, and to get the prices. Next slide, please. So this is the transfer screen. Now what you'll notice is um, all the fields are automatically already filled in. Uh, they include all of the trip details, including all addresses, uh, airports, hotel details, arrival and departure times. This is done automatically. Um, from this point, uh, the agent simply confirms the number of passengers uh, that will be transferred and agrees or, or changes the suggested pickup times. Next slide, please. Now, the software is actually smart enough to also recognise all potential transfer legs. So, uh, in the example that we have here, there's there's the, there's a, there's the transfer from home to the airport, um, from the air uh, from the airport to the hotel, and of course the return trip. So, so four potential transfer legs uh, in total. Next slide, please. Now, all fares are, are calculated automatically in real time. Uh, the agent is presented with a choice of vehicle options for each leg, and getting the exact fare price takes approximately five seconds. Um, this compares to today's process, which could be hours or even days. Um, what's really nice is you can actually expand each, each, uh, each item and drill down for further details, and everything is um, itemised as well for the client, such as road tolls, um, and, and additional features as well. Uh, the only the only um, extra step that's required now is to actually uh, add transfer legs to your cart uh, and to check out. Next slide, please. And upon checking out, uh, the job is dispatched. It's as simple as that. Um, it's immediately dispatched to uh, uh, a network of, of drivers nationally that are actually servicing the particular the particular uh, pickup zone. Next slide, please. And we now have a completed booking. Um, the nice thing is it's fully integrated into the PNR and into the itinerary. Uh, the the system automatically exchanges passenger and driver contact details, so that all parties communicate during the actual pickup um, um, time itself. Um, but very importantly, and uh, and this is actually also built into the system, from an ancillary revenue um, perspective point of view, um, all ground transfers uh, are now not only automated, but they're also monetized as well uh, at up to 10%. That's, um, thank you. That, that, uh, that wraps up my slide.
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we're just going to do one last poll before we get to the, uh, the, uh, the, the final presentation and case study. So let's go straight to that one. Uh, which barrier in your organization most limits innovation and new product development? So is it the cost? Is it the actual culture of the company? Or is there a lack of expert, lack of experience or leadership? So let's get those questions in quickly. We're very keen to uh, get some uh, Q&A time if possible and not finish too, past the, too long past the hour. So uh, I think this was the result many of us were expecting. So let's have, the, uh, let's have those results up there, Gene. Yes, so 58% say it's the cost or the perceived cost that is uh, preventing a lot of this. Um, one in five for both a lack of experience and the culture. So let's go to the, uh, the, the, the final presentation. And this is Rui, who's in uh, Lisbon, Portugal this evening. Uh, good evening or good afternoon, Rui. Hello, Kevin. Good afternoon. <laughs> Hi there. I'm going to hand it over to you straight away. It's, uh, the floor is yours, sir. Okay, thank you. So hello everyone, uh, my name is Rui Figueiredo. I'm a partner at TTS and I'll show you a real life example how strong partnerships can bring added value to the, the industry. Next slide please. So we created TTS uh, in order to bring innovative solutions to areas where there was none. And we decided to do so uh, in exclusive partnership with Travel. Although a recent company, uh, we already provide uh, four solutions for travel agencies, consolidation business, and airlines. Next slide, please. So we are based in Lisbon with offices in Barcelona, and we started focusing our solutions on Latin marketing, taking advantage of the collective knowledge of our team, uh, where several of us are more than 15 years experience in this industry, coming from uh, multinational travel agencies and GDS. And with a strong regional partnership with travel ports, we start rolling out our solutions in several markets, mainly Portugal, Spain, Brazil, and some African countries. Next slide. And in 2011, we joined the Travel Port Developers Network. That brought several additional benefits to our project by providing full access to a wide range of state-of-the-art APIs and the support of a great team focused on combining the global reach of travel ports with innovative solutions from third parties like ourselves. Let me give you an example of one of those solutions. Next slide. So Travel Port Mobile Agent, also known as TMA, is a native mobile solution for Apple mobile devices that provides the user with a quick and easy access to the Galileo GDS, no matter where they are, allowing the user to interact with the GDS even when outside the office. This brings the power of the GDS to the pocket of the travel agent. Next slide. So when TMA was first launched in Brazil, Spain, and Portugal, back in 2010, 11, sorry. Uh, and later in July this year, we uh, did the global launch with the help and support of the Travel Port Developers Network. Up to now, it has been installed over 6,000 times, it spread over more than 90 countries, making what started as a regional solution a true global solution, which we are very proud of. Uh, next slide. So how does TMA works? Well, we try to make it as simple as possible and as fast as technology allows. Uh, travel agents use their existing credentials, so the same ones they use on their desktop. And in a couple of seconds, they are connected to the GDS, as simple as that. Next slide. So once connected, we provide them with a convenient focal point, a style interface that allows uh, the use of the same scripty commands agents know so well, giving them the exact same outputs that they are already used to in, in the desktop environment. So once the user is in, he can access all their agency bookings and he can access the full GDS core content, allowing him to, to service his customers, even outside the office, even on the world. Next slide. And 
TMA also provides uh, feedback of additional features uh, focused on making simpler and faster to work on a mobile device, especially on phones, which are quite small. So one example is programmable keys that allow the user to pre-prepare complex commands um, that are often used and we use them with a simple touch. So basically we have a list of these P keys and um, it touches one of them and interacts with the GDS without any typing at all. Next slide. Another example is this release which uh, keeps the last 50 commands entered to the GDS allowing the user to repeat the commands uh, with a simple touch uh, and again interacting with the GDS in a very fast and easy way. Next slide. So TMA also allows several customization options and the goal is to allow the user to configure TMA in a way if it's better his way of working, you know, from font sizes to colors to application of the answers. Next slide. And one of the cool things is although supporting multiple devices, the level of functionality is the same on all devices. It doesn't matter if you're using a small iPhone or a bigger iPad you get exactly the same level of functionality. And TMA is packed with other features like, you know, the typical screen orientation change, emailing GDS content, uh, quick keys to prevent typing, and, and even, you know, changing your expired passwords while of the road. Next slide. The cool thing about TMA is that the journey just started. So we'll be releasing very soon, actually this month, TMA 2.0, packed with additional features, uh, focused on allowing the agent to do even more, even faster, making them more productive. Still this year, we'll also release TMA for Android with the exact same features as TMA 2.0, and we'll include support for the Apollo GDS, allowing the access of two GDSs on the same application. As for next year, we have planned to include support for the third GDS, WorldSpan, and we will also be closely monitoring the market share of other mobile operating systems and make TMA available on them when it makes sense. So we really believe that this is a very good example of what a strong partnership and the focus of uh, Travelport Developers Network can bring to the travel industry, providing the industry with technology that really makes a difference. Next slide, and thank you. It's quite fast because we're running out of time, but you can review it later. Kevin, back to you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, and appreciate all of the panelists for their for their for their you know sharing what their experiences are, certainly the latter two, and the kind of the top level stuff from uh, from Valen and Jason. So what we're going to do, we've had lots of questions come in, but we're very conscious of everyone's time. So we're going to keep a record of all those questions, and we will make sure that they are posed uh, to each of the individual panelists or as a group um, uh, over the next couple of days. So, but we do have a couple that we did want to get through first of all. Um, uh, these are quite specific, actually. So uh, Jason, if you're still there, I hope you are. I'm sure you are. Uh, Colin asks, uh, Colin Sedotti, I don't know where you're from, Colin, but thanks for the question. You say, is Travelport creating any open, AT open APIs for cruise content? And apologies if you did cover that, but quickly, cruise? Um, we're always looking at new content sources and trying to source the best possible content. And I would say that it's not something that's in UAPI today, but it's definitely something that's on the roadmap. Right, okay. And a quick question for me. I mean, something that did um, come out uh, during your presentation, Jason, was that you were saying you were talking about the next, next generation of travel experiences. I mean, what, what would you say they are, actually, or some examples, or, you know, conceptually, what is this next generation of travel experiences? So, so I think it's a, a much more customized uh, experience. I mean, I think that Apple has changed the playing field for the way that businesses operate. So even in a B2B world, you have to worry much more about the consumer experience. And, you know, good business vendors, you, you can look at the transformation that's occurring at Microsoft right now, whether they'll be successful or not, who knows. But they're trying to get to a higher level of consumerization, much better user experience. And I think this is what the travel industry has suffered. There's a lot of squabbling about who owns the customer rather than actually making the customer right. experience a better one. And I think this is what some of this more uh, sharing of services and, and technology and having open platforms will help drive. Okay, um, this is a question for you, Val, and this is from uh, Kevin Wang. He asks, how many travel providers 
Oh, I just had another load of questions come in and they've all moved down my screen. I'm sorry. How many, uh, how many travel providers support the open travel schema as of today? Um, so uh, make sure I'm not muted. So we, we allow any company to download uh, the schema and we don't require that companies report to us their implementations. Um, and frankly, even if we did require it, we would not, I mean, we would not be able to enforce it. So our, our best guess, um, based on sort of anecdotal and some uh, private surveying, is that there are probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 750 companies in the travel space that have implemented our schema. And that runs from, from the smallest technology providers in you know, remote South Africa to the biggest companies out there. Okay, thanks, Fallon. And, and uh, the, the last question, I think, this is from Patrick Bosworth, and it's back over to you, Jason. You, uh, Patrick asks, is the Travelport API only available to companies that are selling to consumers, or can a B2B predictive analytics platform access aggregated Travelport content for that purpose? And if you're still there, Jason, it would be great. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. I was. On <laughs> we absolutely make it available to, to anybody that's interested in, in accessing it. We, if you go to our development partner network, you can actually uh -huh. sign up and get sandbox credentials and have a play with it almost within uh, you know 10 minutes or so. So I would encourage them to go and have a play and then contact us and let us know what they're thinking of doing with it so we can help them. Okay, and uh, apologies to our two case studies at the end that we haven't had a chance to send the questions to you. But just, you know, I guess the final word to you, Jason, on this, you know, where do you see all this in, say, two years' time? Not, not, not just what, uh, what you guys are doing, but, you know, this kind of slightly more fundamental question about open, uh, you know, open ecosystems. Do you think we'll have evolved that much in two years? I mean, I would love to think that, you know, uh, that we are kind of leading this initiative and I think that as we go forwards, the more open that we can get and the more we can get the uh, partner ecosystem to embrace what we're doing and, and uh, build strong relationships, the more innovation we'll see in the industry. Uh, more innovation is what lots of us would like to see, which gives us certainly lots of things to write about as well. So um, thank you very much uh, to our panel, uh, Jason Nash, Valen Perini, Armand Prol, Rui Figueroa, who were all in today from uh, Portugal, Australia, uh, the US uh, and the UK. We were here in uh, Singapore. So thank you very much to everybody uh, for listening. And obviously thank you enormously to Travelport for supporting once again another uh, T News webinar. So just a reminder, we have recorded the entire thing. That will be up on T News within the next 24 hours. Uh, and all the slides, if you missed the, some of the complicated builds earlier, uh, you can see those all again on the, uh, on the same post that we'll put the video on. So last of all, thank you very much to everybody for listening in, and we'll hope to speak to you or see you all very soon.